Good morning, everyone, I should say. The RTS, as you know, is a seamless intellectual exercise. And we are going to pick up, without you even noticing, some of the themes that were discussed in that fascinating interview a second ago, and one of which is how you should find content, because apparently I was supposed to be and we were supposed to be introduced by Tina, the brilliant Tina, a second ago. But that didn't happen. So hopefully you're still staying tuned. Here we are. We are going to be talking about uh, a session called Go Global or Go Home, almost the direct opposite of the UKIP manifesto. <laughs> and we, we, uh, I'm joined by a brilliant panel who I'll introduce in a moment. Just to give you a sort of just a very brief line at the top, I think the notion that uh, we should create, we're all involved in creating global IP is an uncontroversial one. We're all searching for it, fi trying to find it. It's like world peace, uh, the re-election of Jeremy Corbyn. It's the sort of thing we work tirelessly for in this room. Um, I have, have I read the room right? No. Um, so we, we definitely want to do it. But how do you do it? How do you go about it? How do you deliver that? How should you organize uh, a, 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 as a company? How should you think? Can you think globally uh, about content? These are some of the issues we probably won't have time for in the next 45 minutes, because it is going to be quick. Uh, it is going to be a 40-minute session, but I'm delighted to be joined by a brilliant panel. Very much the, I mean, they have been described as the Mel, Sue, Paul, and Mary of global content. Um, um, I'll leave you to decide who's who. We're joined by Stephen Lambert, who is CEO of Studio Lambert and founder, it says here, just in case you didn't understand, it's all Stephen's, it's all his, it's his name, it's his company. Um, Tim Davey, Tim, you are CEO of BBC Worldwide and Director Global. Congratulations on that. Um, Jane Millichip, your MD of Sky Vision. No other bits to your title? Okay, no. good. Uh, and Michael Edelstein, you are President, NBC Universal International. Have I got that? Studios. Studios. They are welcome. So it's great to be joined by all of you. Um, just before we get into some of the detail, we're going to have a look at the, the drama market in a second as a place to start. It would seem churlish not to touch on the piece of IP, the piece of international IP that everybody's talking about, um, Great British Bake Off, Beca uh, simply because we're joined by two partners on that program. Jane uh, is on the board of Love Productions. Is that correct, Jane? Right. Yeah, you're enjoying this already, aren't you? Yeah. Because um, <laughs> uh, you own uh, Love Productions. And Tim, you distribute this. Outside the US. We have format rights for 12 years, and we sell the UK show. Thank you. So, Jane, Sky have oddly been quite silent on this, given their close relationship with the BBC. What um, good deal for Sky, Bake Off? Good deal for you. You must be pleased. Uh, I'm pleased we have a resolution, yes. Um, the fact is that Love uh, took part in uh, necessary negotiations for over a year and uh, did not come to a resolution with the BBC. And failing that, um, had the full backing of Sky the board to take the decision to walk away. And that's a, it's a good deal, therefore, yeah. for you. Yeah, and know. therefore, um, the deal with uh, Channel 4 we're delighted with. Um, I know all other broadcasters were very keen to uh, pick up Bake Off. Why wouldn't you? It's, it's the most uh, popular show on television. Um, Who was the um, keenest after the BBC? Uh, well, I think it, was, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't just keenness. It was where it's best placed. And uh, even though I'm a you know, fully paid-up employee of Sky... Um, I think we feel that Channel 4 is the best place for the show. Uh, it's still in free-to-air. It's still with a broadcaster with a strong um, public service remit. So we're, we're, we're delighted with the Thank outcome and the circumstances. Thank you, Joe. And Tim, you, you distribute this content, and we're going to touch on some of these issues in, yeah. in, in, in the panel about um, ownership of IP and distribution of IP. Would you think, you know, you're, you're, is it better for you that Paul Hollywood became, would it be better for him to be the presenter of Top Gear, as we understand he was being offered, or the sole surviving presenter of Bake Off and Channel 4, which yeah, is going to make one. And actually it. behind that, what I'm getting at, I yeah. suppose, is, yes, a cheap jibe, but secondly, um, <laughs> is, it's, um, it's about how yeah. you see talent and how you see formats and, 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 and IP as, you know, and what's the success Well, our main Bake Off business to? by a mile is the uh, 20 countries that make a localised version of Bake Off, and that rare alchemy that you see. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Two non-scripted shows, yeah. the biggest news of the year as we were talking, both of which had that curious, as I say, alchemy between the talent, which is incredibly difficult to pull off. You know, we tried in Top Gear, didn't quite work last season, we'll come back with people we think can work, but this is difficult. But from a BBC Worldwide point of view, 
it's pretty straightforward. My business, my main business, is Le Mire Patissier and doing the shoe pastries and the uh, other things in France uh, and working through that. I have to say, where we own the IP, it's a more attractive financial proposition, but I'm still happy to yeah. do, be doing the business. You're such a Renaissance man, Tim. That French was, was wonderful. So just thank you for that. Let's, thank you for gonna, that. We're going to touch on some of those issues we go through, but we're going to start, um, <laughs> not the patissier bit. Um, yeah. We're going to start with looking at drama. Drama is a much celebrated um, golden age, as we're told, in drama. How should we think about drama from a global perspective? How should we do those deals? Um, how, do you, how do you ensure the best content reaches as many people uh, uh, as possible, as, as Steve Burke was touching on just, just a second ago? So, Michael, we're going to start um, with a, a show that hardly ever gets mentioned, Downton Abbey. Um, heard which, of it. Yeah, which, was, which we've already heard about. Um, and, and look at the genesis of that and how you feel... As with a global perspective, you were able to deliver that show and what benefits you as NBC you were able to bring to it. But we're going to start, I think, with a clip that you've prepared. You've personally prepared. So let's just have a quick look Great. at Downton. So, uh, um, so let, 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 let me ask you a question at this moment. In, what have you and NBC added to that mix? Because you've got a drama, beautifully written drama. Sure. You've got a hit on ITV1, so it's starting to go... In what way would Downton not have gone global anyway? Well, I mean, let's go back to 2010. If you look at British drama in 2010, we didn't, I don't think anybody saw that you could create a global phenomenon like Downton became. And I think the gift for all of us in this room is, you know, for every buyer around the world, Downton has shown them that you can make a British drama that can compete with US dramas in terms of price per hour. So. It, it's been an extraordinary gift that way. I think what we brought to the table was Gareth named Julian Fellows made an extraordinary television program. And in truth, uh, you know, in 2010, when the show went on, nobody knew what to expect out of it. We saw it very early in Rough Cut. We got very excited about it because it didn't play like a traditional British drama in the sense that many British dramas are dark, are heavy. Downton is entirely aspirational, whether you're a chambermaid who dreams of being a secretary, or you're the lady of the house just trying to find love, um, it really touched on something that we thought was aspirational and global. So we pushed it out to all of our clients. Tim Warner, who you saw in the video from Australia, you know, he had passed on the show initially because it was part of our output deals globally. British period drama is not what people thought of from NBC Universal. Belinda Menendez, my colleague who runs distribution, actually sat Tim down in her office and said, I do want you to watch this show. We've known each other a long time. He saw it, got very excited by it. They ran a very progressive, very modern marketing campaign using contemporary music to sell the show. And um, you know, we also got very involved in an Emmy campaign in America, figuring if we could make the show successful in the US, that would drive global awareness and sales. But one of the things I think is interesting to think about is from a, creative, a creator's point of view, you know, what, what, what do they kind of get out of these relationships? And all of you in different ways have, relation, you know, have creators who have relationships with you. Mm -hmm. um, how do, for Gareth Neem, sure. the carnival, you know, in the end, the world was his oyster, right? He could go wherever he wanted, right? He could take his pick. And increasingly, creators have this power, right? Correct. With the right IP. So how do you differentiate yourself, if I can put it that way? Is it, so for example, is it about the sort of deals you can do for him? I, I think it's both. I think every creator wants something different from a media partner. So we have deals with David Heyman, Tim Bevan, Eric Fellner, Gareth Neem. Everybody wants something different from us. I think what we have to do as a media company is respond to our partners. So we don't take a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, Gareth runs an incredible creative shop. He knows what he wants to make. Sometimes we bring them ideas or IP that Carnival gets excited about. But by and large, um, we're fairly hands-off with Carnival stuff. David Heyman, who is our partner, um, we are building a company with him together. David and I probably speak three times a week. Um, he's very engaged and, and wants a lot of collaboration. So I, I think the important thing to do as you look at creative people is, is take the approach that one size does not fit all. You have to create a bespoke um, method of, of, of relationship with each of them. Right. So Jane, you could run an argument, I suppose, that Downton kind of almost kicked off this whole drama. Let's not worry about whether it's a golden age or not kind of thing, but this, 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 the, the power of drama. How do you think about it now? Because 
it's, it's frankly a very complex area in terms of the way you fund it now, increasingly like the, the, more like the film industry than perhaps yeah. the television industry. Where do you think that market's at now? You know, we, and particularly with reference to the sort of notion of there might be a little bit of a bubble here. Yeah, a lot of people have talked about peak drama. I don't think we're there yet, and I don't think um, the public's appetite for telling stories will ever be dimmed. So in that respect, we haven't got too much drama, no. Uh, the more poignant question is, um, are we still able to fund it? And I think we do need to be quite wary at the moment. Ambition has never been higher for drama. Uh, film star casting, we see all the time, every broadcaster needs to be distinctive. Um, ambition is only going up. Licence fees aren't necessarily going up, uh, mm -hmm. particularly the commissioning licence fees. Um, you know, they're, they're benchmarks against the right. available audience, and as we know, linear audiences aren't rising particularly. So the gap is appearing in uh, the international deficit. Um, and I think we need to be a little bit wary. I think if we're not careful, we could be heading for a you know, subprime mortgages moment. Um, if we don't invest wisely and judiciously, um, um, a lot of distributors are investing in drama and um, uh, fulfilling a sizable portion of the budget two years before that show is ever delivered. And, and then it's another year of sales. Right. You could be three years down the line before you realize whether you're going to recoup or not. Yes. Um, I don't think the model is broken, but I think what we need to do now is source more, fund, more forms of funding that aren't deriving their value necessarily from the international pot, whether that's government funding, whether it's foundations, whether it's branded content, um, uh, the, the media agencies. I think we need fresh blood in the funding mix to revive it, because I think it's, it's stressed at the moment with the broadcaster, the producer, and the distributor. I think uh, it's not broken. And I think judici judicious in, um, investment will still come, come good. Um, but I think we're seeing... I mean, the, 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 the indicators for me are, um, for instance, uh, Z Nation, perfectly good drama at the moment, has just sold to Pick in the UK. Now, great channel. It's one of the Sky Portfolio yep. channels. Um, I bet Pick wasn't on the business plan when they uh, were right. forecasting their UK yeah. license yeah. fees. Yeah. So uh, I've no idea if that show is recouped or not. I hope it has for the people who made it. But when you see shows like that appearing in first run in big markets, you've got a question. Sure. Have, are we, tip, are yeah. we at that tipping point? And, and Tim, do you recognize the subprime um, uh, thought about, about drama? That, that I recognize think? the risk. I mean, I think if, if you boil it down, I think the party's going to continue for a few years, yeah? The number I saw actually was 1,310 new international drama series this year, which is a staggering number. And if you boil it all down, it, it's, the, it's what drives pay subscription. That's what, I mean, Downton's done a fantastic job. It's an amazing thing. I walk around the world as a BBC executive, and people congratulate me on Downton on a regular basis. Mm. Um, which I forgot to do at the beginning, so apologies. Uh, but the, uh, and I think it's, just, it's, a, it's a stunning show. But being provocative, I don't think it was driven by a show. This phenomenon is driven by pay uh, and pay platforms understanding what's really driving subscription in terms of subscription take up, not so much renewal. And that's, you know, sport and drama. If you really look at it, now, by the way, I think the non scripted market's got huge we'll, potential. We'll come to that. We'll come to that, yeah. Um, but, but in terms of the, the risks, I think they are there. I think that Jane puts it very well in terms of the funding challenges for us all. I would say that there is a, I mean, there is a really interesting and slightly um, uh, kind of limited conversation in my mind around international returning series. We, we are, I mean, BBC Worldwide now is over 50% drama, about half our business. I mean, remember, we were natural history, 59,000, all the things that we've got in terms of our breadth, but we are a drama-powered company now. But I'm as interested in really good episodic. If you've got a really good episodic script, by the way, you know, the CSI of London is waiting to happen. We do a lot of business in that. We do a lot of business in, you know, lower price drama, a daytime strand like Father Brown on BBC One sells brilliantly well. We recruit, we recoup quickly. I do think it's a game in which you have to watch your amort. Sorry yeah. to be very dry about it, but where your money's going and know exactly, you know, what cash is going out the door. I think you have to be incredibly creative about, you know, who owns what and how funding gets in. We're looking at ways in which we can create drama funding by using third party money at the moment. I'm working on a few ideas in that right. area. Um, but but sort of third parties in what sort of sense? What kind of parties are we talking? We're talking... Well, there's lots of capital out there. The question is, is, is who you, uh, those people who have been involved in 
private equity or other things. It's all about the culture and the people, the returns yeah. they want, and the shape of that, that risk profile. I'm without giving too much away. I think there. Are, I'm more than willing to. By the way, as long as I've got share of IP and got a thick share, or a reasonable share, that you know, going into it together, looking at that risk profile. I don't think we're quite at the Jeff Shell looking at the movies and saying I just putting a few hundred million and hoping for the best and one of them will max out. We're not right. quite at that. A smart drama portfolio can be mm. more de-risked than that, but I do recognize James' risk. And Stephen, you have um, frankly been continually annoying over the years at creating massive non-scripted hits, mm. if I can say that on a personal level. Um, <laughs> uh, just <laughs> deeply, deeply annoying. Yeah. Um, now, it's not many, to be fair. Now, <laughs> now you're going into scripted, I think, right? You've, you've, you've signaled that you're going into scripted. Um, which, God, please don't make a success of that as well. Are you, what are you, what, is it too late to join the party? Are you concerned about coming at this point, you know, when we're actually at this sort of ma perhaps maximum capacity? How do you see the model from your point of view? No, I, I don't think it's too late. I mean, I think that you have to, be, be, as a British broadcast uh, producer, you have to be very aware of the opportunities in, in America. And I've always operated as a British-American producer in the last 20 years. Um, I think that um, I, th I think this business of is there a risk of a subprime? I mean, it's all about predicting the hits, and we don't know what the hits are going to be. And so it's easy to say, oh yes, we need to be careful. But who knows what the hits are going to be? Interestingly, Downton didn't end up on an NBC channel in America. It's on PBS. Um, you know, how does one? The only way you can actually de-risk is to have enough. Enough fires in the in, 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 enough fires in the fire, Terrible. so that the hits pay for all the failures. Right, but particularly on the scripted model, you know, you're used to non-scripted, right? Which is which is sort of low to no risk, effectively, right? It yes. costs very little to get a Y swap or. Um, well, I mean, the, it's more that the, the the buyer will pay the full cost of production. Yeah, exactly. So, and they pay you even if it doesn't work, right? They pay for pilot. All all of that we know we know very well. Scripted is a very different model. So, how do you think about it as a creator? Of, of shows in terms of picking the right hit and then taking those risks. Is that, is that why you're part of a global... So is that why you're part of all three, for example? Does that help you in some way, organising on a sort of more global international level? No, I mean, I think the benefit of all three is that you have a great relationship with a good distributor and that you have initial funding to start your company. Um, it... it uh, I, I think the way you think of it is that you try to... The hardest thing we have in operating as a, an originator in a particular market is that you have to sell initially to the buyers in that market. And they're not thinking about the international market. Uh, the people who buy in Britain are not incentivized, really, to care about whether it's going to be a global hit. The, the, their partners in BBC Worldwide might be, if you think of the BBC buyers or ITV Network and, and, and ITV Global or whatever, but the actual buyers are so focused, probably rightly, on simply getting a hit for their, for their network. And time and again, what they're interested in has very little international value. And you see this particularly with drama. I mean, the fact that so much drama is bought is still very small in the number of episodes. It's very British, which can occasionally work. Obviously, Downton is the extreme example. But not as often it's very dark, uh, as Michael mentioned earlier. And... You know, if you're trying to get into that business, you've somehow got to find the things that aren't necessarily just the, the, the obvious um, ideas that appeal to the n national buyers. You have to be thinking what will work yes. internationally. And Michael, do, how do you help creators think internationally? I think there's a point that Stephen made and Tim, we were talking about it earlier, that actually quite often US, there's a sense that the US buyers mm -hmm. see uh, European, UK, writers and producers as producing rather dark, I mean, rather wonderful, very highly authored mm -hmm. shows. Downton is, is not that, right? It's, it's a wonderful Well, I think thing. it's so, wonderful. So, yeah, exactly. So, so, but, but, but Downton seems to be the exception. And actually, what we would all love as producers is, is to be seen as like, let's come up with the next CSI, the next ER. How do you manage that process? Well, I think the next CSI, the next ER, if you look at the US, those shows aren't rating either. So we're in a world right now where people seem to really gravitate towards serialized content. I mean, the good news for all of us sitting here, our SVOD players really like that content, need that content, right. and want more global content. So as, while well, free-to-air broadcasters, especially across Europe, 
would like more um, procedural content, the nice thing for all of us is this SVOD market has developed. So on that specialized, really high quality British content, there is a place for it now. I, I don't think you can tell content creators what to create. I think you can look at a piece of material at its onset and say, this is what we believe are the economic prospects for this piece of material. You can choose how much to fund that project based on what you think its prospects are, and that's always in collaboration with the producer. Um, you can't go about saying, hey, I just want to make big content that sells all over the world. Nobody sees a global hit coming, but they just happen because they're incredibly specific, they're very well executed, and everybody comes together to do their job you know, incredibly well. Tim would yeah. like to disagree. I, I'm going to disagree in terms of this. this I'm going to disagree or just add a bit yeah. of color in here because I'm not sure I fully agree with Stephen on the, on the need for serialized and the kind of worry about short length, dark UK drama. I'm making Happy Valley works for me beautifully. It's a great piece. It, it wasn't conceived with the international market in mind. It was, it was conceived. It was returning, but it then, you know... I was talking about short at, runs that don't return. Well, there's, there's plenty of those. War and Peace was very nice. And when I heard it was in six parts as a distributor, I said, are you sure? And someone who kind of reasonably knows the book, not that well. Um, uh, that worked, worked well for us. Perfect. I'll take as many of those as I can get. I love them creatively. I think they're beautiful pieces of work. I think Andrew Davis wrote it stunningly. And that, to me, is a well worth the effort. Uh, I think Sherlock is fantastic for us. It's, it's a brand that's growing as a franchise around the world, uh, theme parks, everything else. Look at the volume that does. It's more of a, it's more of a movie profile in some ways. I just, I but just, you wouldn't like to have more episodes of Sherlock? Uh, maybe, but no, I, don't think, I don't think you can have them. Because based on the talent and based on Stephen and based on the construction of that project, that's not... What I wouldn't do is put a writing team in place or a writer's room and try and create more Sherlock. Just personally, I wouldn't do that. I okay. think it's special. Thank, thank you. Jane, we're going to move on to non-script set, but Jane, you just wanted to... Yeah, to so I'm, and I, I think uh, British drama isn't necessarily just defined by short run. At Sky, we're investing in long run. I mean, it's much more the US cable model. Uh, eights, tens, ensemble casts, um, uh, strong cast, with a view to the international market. Um, particularly, I think they're quite US-leaning mm. dramas from mm. Sky. And as a result, we are getting co-production, great co-production partners as a result of that yeah. with Fortitude, Riviera, uh, Britannia is a, a, a very big um, period piece coming up. So I think um, um, Hooten and the Lady is one of the most frivolous, fun pieces right, of yeah. television yeah. on Sky One at the moment. There's nothing bleak about it. So we are changing what, the way we make the dramas. Um, behind the paywall at Sky, we have the opportunity to do that because we're building that model up from scratch. So it's not all bleak. Yeah, that's good news. We're going to look at uh, non-scripted for, for, for now in, in this context. Think about how we, and if it's possible, to think globally about it. And Stephen will come to you. But we're going to start with a clip of Gogglebox, which is in how many countries, Stephen? Uh, it's in 32. It, there was a, Mongolia's just recommissioned it. <laughs> 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 it's, 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 they watch it in yurts. Uh, Around Mongolia's one television. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, in, in Lebanon, they watch it smoking shish. Um, it's, uh, it's, yes, it's that's amazing. Weird. That's, how, that's how I watch it. Okay, so um, <laughs> let's, let's have a quick look at Gogglebox. So, Stephen, when you're thinking, let's take Gogglebox, about your ambitions for global content, shows traveling to 30-odd countries and so on, you don't sit there with your team, do you, I guess, and think, let's come up with a show that will travel, right? You're not thinking that. You're thinking, let's make something that Channel 4 will like or whatever it happens Yes, to be. but we're obviously thinking about shows that we think are repeatable. We're thinking about shows that have a format. We're thinking about shows that um, will, 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 will have the variety of um, storytelling within that structure, within that format that we're coming up with, that means that they will have life. Um, that it won't just be the same, the same thing all the time. I mean, the skill is to try to find something that has the repeatable elements, but still the variety. Um, so, but no, you're, 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 you're trying to come up with an idea that you fall in love with and get excited about, and that's quite rare. Um, but when you do, you convey that enthusiasm to the people you're trying to sell it to, and very often they will react to that and give you a chance to make it. 
And so many of these ideas are then live or die by the execution. I never thought that Gogglebox would go around the world because it's a very difficult show to make because you've got so little time to film and edit it. And it's, it's, it's a comedy. And comedy is all about the, 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 the skill of editing. And we've got so little time to edit it. And we had a team that were able to do that. But I was very skeptical that other countries would have similar teams. But I was proved wrong. I mean, there, there clearly people have... The, the talent in all over the world to make it. And how much does the broadcast, the Channel 4, in this case, the home of baking, how much do they <laughs> help develop that idea? How much are they thinking, actually, there's the potential here for this travel? What's that process like for you? And has that changed over the years as people become more um, uh, knowledgeable about the, how these formats might travel? I, I don't think that Channel 4 think about it in terms of its international value. They, they, they're thinking... <laughs> solely in terms about whether it's going to work for their schedule. And I think that they... I mean, Jade talks about how Gogglebox is an example of a show that she stuck with, even though it didn't rate that strongly in its first run. Right. But I would say, actually, that wasn't quite the whole story. It, it, its audience increase across those first four episodes was, was dramatic. So it started off low at 700,000. Right. By the end of the four-episode run, it was rating at least 1.5, 1.6. It, it was just growing each episode. And the reaction on Twitter was so strong. So, it, it, yes, it was you know, a good thing that she wanted to carry on with it. But she's thinking... Anyway, I'm slightly sidetracking. I mean, the point is that I don't think she's... The, the, the Channel 4 are not talking about it from the point of view of right. international value, obviously. So you're, you're, you're thinking of... Uh, you're in the right area. You want repeatability. You want formats and so on. But does being part of all three have any bearing on that? You're part of a group who, who obviously are, are, are international, want content to grow. Does that have any effect on the, the creative process or on the deal process? Or are you...? Um, no, I think it's more to do with the fact that all three international is a very good distributor, and we work very closely with them on um, taking it to the international market and um, making sure that we provide the right support. For, I mean, Gogglebox just launched in, in Ireland last week, and we put a lot of energy into helping the team there make the show. We, so I think that all three's value is much more... I think the question is more the other way around. If you're all three, what's the best way of creating lots of successful companies? Do you get them to talk to each other a lot about their ideas, or do you just let them get on with operating with their own cultures and make sure that as a result right. of owning them, you're able to centralise the distribution? And that's the all three model, and I think it's a very interesting question as to how much, if you've got a group of companies, you want them to talk to each other. All three's always had the policy of don't force them all together because you, you, you don't get much benefit. Yeah. Well, let, let's, have a, let's drill down on that a bit, because actually all of you are in different ways. Um, if the battle is for IP ownership and distribution, you're, you're thinking of lots of ways, the deals you're sort of doing on drama, co-productions and so on, across to actually buying into talent. Um, we've talked about I'm not going to mention Love Productions again, don't worry. Um, we've talked about buying into those, um, uh, the creatives and their companies. So, Michael, let me ask you. Stephen's sort of outlet, um, talked about one particular way of approaching an all-three model, which we will take at face value. That's exactly how it works. How do you think about the people you've bought into those companies and, and what, what's, the, what's the sort of culture and the way you approach it? Sure, we're a bit of a hybrid in the sense of, I, I wouldn't say we're an all-three model, but we're not that far from it in reality. Um, creatively, we let the companies get on with what they do. I think what we decide... So, sure. sure, but can I ask you what that means? Because that is a phrase we hear a lot. I'm yes. not suggesting it's not 100% no, no, true. true. But when people say, well, the thing about us is we let the creatives get on with it. You know, right. In the end, you need... They're accountable to Correct. you. Correct. You have a pipeline to feed. You have the US to, to, to talk to and, 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 as it were, to justify these... Deals. So how do you... How do you make that happen? Well, I think, I think it's an interesting thing. We are in a creative business. Those two things are not a natural fit with each other. I used to be a producer. I didn't wake up in the morning as a producer going, how am I going to make money today? I would get excited about a show. So it starts from the inception. What I look for are people who get excited about making programs. With that said, we are also a, a very financially driven company. So you want to be in business with people who understand that, who accept that, and are willing to collaborate with you. Um, in terms of how we run our businesses, you know, creatively, I don't tell David Heyman or Tim Bevan or Eric Fellner what I think they should produce. 
I will from time to time, if I see something that I think fits with who they are, send them an article or my team will send them an article or a book or a writer and, and hopefully you get that spark between a producer and a piece of material. In terms of where we are more central, um, you know, business affairs and finance, we do centrally for the most part. It allows us to share best practices across the group. So if one group is negotiating with a behemoth like Netflix, the other group should benefit from it accordingly. Same thing whether it's ITV, BBC, um, you know, any broadcaster around the world. So, um, and then finance, we try to, we are a very, very heavy company in terms of finance and reporting. We have to be, we're a publicly traded company. So we try to take that off the hands of the producers, but of course they have access to as much information as they want. But, but and how, how, does, how do the U.S. think about what you're trying to do here? By which I mean, you know, if you look at what you, we heard Steve yeah. was talking earlier, you, know, you, you, have a, you have a clear presence here. Um, but for example, in non-scripted, you could look at it and think it's relatively light. It's a small presence. Uh, it's here a small presence. Yes. So is that because you think um, simply the people aren't out there? or that the companies are too expensive, or how, how, how do you think about I that? I mean, if, as you've seen from what we've done, we, obviously we bought Carnival and that predated me. We spent uh, a fair bit of money buying you know, an incredible production company and that's really paid off. I think since then what we've decided to do is really invest in creative people as opposed to go out and buy big businesses. We've made a few acquisitions. They've been um, at a price we thought was reasonable, but more important than that price was we got together with those companies because we believed they were incredibly talented, and we thought by injecting capital into their day-to-day -day and some know-how, we could help grow the business. So that's been our strategy. We haven't really gone out you know, and made a big acquisition since I've been here, um, and yet we've really grown the number of hours significantly. So we've, we're very comfortable sort of, you know, in some ways it's a venture capital model. We get involved with businesses, we put money into those businesses, we help those businesses grow. Um, and then over time, um, I think it's good for everybody. And Jane, you have taken stakes in people. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you think about where the real, I suppose it's almost where the power lies here now, because you've got a number of creators out there who can create value and create IP. You're all more or less, I mean, doing all sorts of things, but one of the things you're all doing is competing, I suppose, for those people and saying, come and be with us, right? Come and, come and unlock your global potential with us. How do you, what's your offering? And how do you think about those deals? Well, I think uh, quality, scale, and sustainability are the three words we try and stick with at Sky Vision. Um, when I joined three years ago, we definitely needed scale. It was a small business that had been acquired by Sky. Um, and I felt that we needed to move to a mixed ecology in terms of the, the revenue portfolio. I didn't feel comfortable just relying on distribution revenues. So that's when we made the, the couple of the, the, the right. first bigger, bigger acquisitions of Love and Jupiter in the US. Since then, we've made uh, investments in startups like Sugar Films, uh, Talos in the States. Um, and, and it's about building a complementary portfolio. If you kind of drew a Venn diagram of their spheres of interest, there's some overlap in, in crime, for instance, but mostly they sit neatly together. Um, they're not in competition with each other. They've all got room for growth. Room for growth is another thing. I mean, in a world of kind of, you know, um, um, uh, inflation in, in the consolidation market, we, what we need are businesses that still have room for growth and sustainability. So brands that will... Uh, returning brands that will continue beyond right. any earnout, for instance. Um, from Sky Vision's perspective, we work um, extensively with the development teams. We don't tell them what to do, but there's a lot you can do as a distributor to help hone a slate, to make it, tweak it, to make it more viable for international. So it's kind of light touch, really, and we find most of the development teams are hungry for that information. You know, how do we make it more saleable? Um, but we're not telling them what to do, absolutely not. And we're a wildly promiscuous sector. You know, I mean, I mean NBCU has yeah. Sky shows, I've got ITV shows and BBC yeah. shows. You know, we're all selling each other's shows. We, we've got seven production business under, under Sky Vision's brand. The, the broadcaster we produce least for is Sky. Right. You know. Yeah. But, what, but why, why should... You know, this gets, sort of gets to the heart of this sort of global issue in terms of creativity and IP, which is why should an independent... Let, let's take an example. Mm. I, I don't think she's here. Jane Featherston, for example, just yeah. as someone who's a well-known BBC... a uh, well-known uh, drama producer mm. in the UK market who's gone out sort of independently mm. and uh, I think has publicly said, you know, she's not allying herself to one particular distribution partner and so on, because and I suppose this is where this is supposition now. I suppose what she's thinking is I'll find the right project and then mm. I'll be able to play the field and she's not mm. alone in that, right? Why... 
I mean, she, that, that's where the power is, right? When it comes to global economy, she yeah, and others like her have got... There's certainly inflation in the distribution business at the moment right. in terms of acquiring rights, and that's why we all have to be careful about you know, uh, the, the level of investment. Um, I think in drama, it's slightly different. Right. Um, in a, in when, if you buy a factual business, you buy a volume business of largely fully funded shows. Mm -hmm. So it's a simpler dynamic. Um, with a drama company, it's usually lower volume in terms of the number of shows they, they develop. And so the, the question investing in a drama business is slightly different. Am I going to invest in that business to have the lovely job of then, you know, then having the privilege of then deficit funding all of their dramas right. for ITV, Channel 4, yeah, and BBC? Yeah. And so the question for me at Sky is, is you know, it's, it's a slightly different dynamic right. than buying a, a, um, a, um, a, a, a non-scripted company. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's certainly inflation and, and competition. Can I jump in for one second, though, real quickly? I'll come I, I think the thing that's also you have to think about in terms of being an independent is every time you make a relationship with a distributor as a content producer, you're putting your life in their hands. Right. So yes, they'll give you a guarantee, but you want someone who's going to be really vested in selling your content. You want somebody you trust. The other thing is, as any content creator knows, when you have a program that needs funding, the deficits are growing larger and larger and larger. And you don't want to spend a lot of time having to look for money um, when you have a green light. So it, right. you know, there are advantages. Yes, you can go independent, but there are trade-offs in that every time you get into a new business relationship, you don't know who you're in business with. Sure. I, mean, I think Michael touched on what I was going to say, actually, which is, at a strategic level, it's slightly exhausting because everyone says the same thing. We're going to give loads of headroom to talent. We're going to give them freedom. Do you say it in that words. way, Tim? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't need, I, 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 I do. think that might actually, explain why you're yeah. yeah. Well, we're doing well. It's compelling. <laughs> We've made loads of investments this year. We got the best. But no, um, and it, it's That's highly better. competitive. And, and I think the word trust is kind of, I, mean, I think when you get to it, the, you do get, this is a people business. People, will, people are going to people they want to work with. I think when it comes to your question about there are people with enough power who are going to play independent models now, and that's going to be a factor in the market. Agents in Hollywood will find this. Everyone, like, kind of, screw you all. You're all middle people. I'm stepping out this, and I'm going to play. And if you've got the capital to do that, you've got the equity to do that, it's a viable option. Let's just be honest about that. But there are, there are ways in which companies like BBC Worldwide or all three can say, OK, well, that's great. That's one route. I think it's all about people and their personal choices, what they like doing in the morning. That means you're running your own company, you're hustling, you've got... There are people who want some capital to make their businesses run, set their companies up. There are people who want to, particularly in scripted, less so in unscripted, want, want specialists in terms of funding. And it's a complicated game. You know, what's the right deal to do with Netflix? Do I give my first window, second window? I mean, the idea that we're just... I mean, one thing I've done with Worldwide is we're not really a distribution. I mean, we're moving all our effort is, is further up the value chain. Have I got the IP that I own? What do I own? Because we found out that if you don't right. own stuff, that can be quite messy. Cake analogy to follow. The, um, the, that's an issue. So my view is there are multiple reasons why an individual would want to come and have fun and be happy. And I do get enthused by that. Sure working with a bigger company. That's absolutely their prerogative. And I, I think that it's a very valid route. I think everyone is saying they're going to get the right headroom, they're going to get the credit process, we're not going to interfere. I think an unscripted, by the way, it's about a lead. No one went into Strictly, the Strictly Come Dancing original pitch and said, boy, have I got an idea that's going to work in Mongolia. It just happens. We're in 51 countries, and we're knocking the ball out of the park in America. It's weird. That's how it works. I mean, Stephen did it beautifully and summarized why you need a passionate individual just to sell a show to a lead broadcaster yeah. unscripted. Forget the global for a minute. Just go and sell a show to a lead broadcaster. But Stephen, do you, and do, do you think this sort of model as such is, is sustainable, by which I mean these bigger companies who are you know, consolidated companies, the, the American studios and so on, here, who, are, who are trying to create and, and clearly succeeding in creating creative you know, um, companies, a creative atmosphere that encourages um, value creators to be part of it. Is that sustainable? Will, will there be any cracks in that? Or is it just about how you deliver well, I think the challenge is, is always that if you've got groups that are investing in very talented people, those are usually on deals that come to an end. And it's about how you renew those deals. Um, and there are interesting ways that certainly at all three we've, we've been pioneering that um, ensure that the key people stay when they get to their end of the deal. So breaking this sort of earn-out culture 
Mm -hmm. is that you, you're also thinking about that because that's a big issue, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. How are you thinking about it? I'm or not you? telling you. Good, excellent. <laughs> excellent. That is extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> But, but that's become an issue, right? Which is that sure, the value I mean, I just is... Renewed, is uh, I did a new deal with all three Congratulations, um, end of last year. How many yachts were involved? Phony, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was joking. The size. Yeah. Um, but but <laughs> it, it, just it was an unusual, an unusual way of doing a deal um, that it binds in the whole team as well. And I think that that's the key thing is how uh, you, you start up a company, you buy a company, and they get to the end of their earnouts, and the temptation to start all over again is enormous. Sure. And a lot of big groups are seeing how easy it is to lose those people and how easy it is for those people to start up again and not necessarily with you. Mm. We're actually, thank you, Steve. We're, we're actually going to go to the audience now. We have five minutes left, and actually we might pick up on this point of, uh, that we've just been on or whatever, you, whatever you'd like to ask about. So if you just put your hand up, I think there's probably a roving mic somewhere. Who would like to ask a question? Anywhere. Uh, no, excellent. That is terrific. You sure you don't want to ask? Because I will carry on on the panel. No, nobody wants to ask a question. Um, Tim, nobody wants to ask a question. <laughs> um, what are we going to do about it? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to continue to think about how you incentivize and bring in a, 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 a talent. Um, no, we're not. I'm editing as we go along. Actually, I'm thinking this. This structure now, this, this ecosystem we now have, where we think about the, um, the lights just go down. You've had your moment. I love the way the lights just, <laughs> they're gone, the audience, who cares? Um, the, 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 this, this, this ecosystem, which has sort of a rather brilliant UK, because of PSBs, commercial uh, broadcasters. Now we have these, the studios and the consolidated companies are, uh, are now here and, and doing extremely well. Do you think this is where we're at now? Has the market changed and is now going to solidify into, into sort of bigger groups? Within this kind of strange, you know, much much heralded sort of UK ecosystem, is, is this is this now where we that are for those years? That's a hell of a question. I wish well, the audience had said something. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> they didn't. So there you are. I I think with the BBC license fee settlement and the right political climate, the wonders, and I mean that, the wonders of the PSBs in terms of their commissioning, their creative chutzpah, their ability to originate stuff is is hopefully safe for quite some time now, which I think is really important to the creative lifeblood of this organization, uh, this organization as the BBC, talking to the BBC, but also to the whole ecosystem. It's utterly, it's the thing that pumps value through the system. What's the um, BBC's view on owning these independent production companies, though? Is it, is, is, um, well, you're investing well, in well, them, but you tend to then... Well, I, well, now, I'm, I mean, I say this very openly, which is, we, we, I'm, not a, I'm not a venture capitalist as the BBC. I'm not trying to make money on a stake. I'm trying to secure content, primarily from producers who are working with the BBC and PSBs. And what we, we did that by taking minority stakes and having first look. We are having to go deeper with people and do the kind of crazy but, things that I won't talk about, that we're all not going to talk about, but, which is how you keep... Getting back to the system very quickly, I think the risk, by the way, is just how it shapes between SVOD providers, Prime. That, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's another panel, which is how do you ensure the right creative landscape and the right prominence for service brands all through that system? That is going to change radically. So the idea that it, yeah. it's, it's solid... I think, it's, I think there's quite a lot of jeopardy for, there's, there's more for movement Brooklyn. There's a lot of movement. And, and the, the, talking of um, the Netflix, the, the, the over-the-top providers and stuff, Jane, one of the things about those guys, I suppose, is that unusually they're talking for sort of distribution, but they're coming straight to the creatives, right? And they're talking so directly nice. in their language. I mean, if anyone has perfected that we'll leave you alone, um, yeah. Netflix and, and Amazon and others are, are doing a brilliant job at that. That's a proper threat to you, right? And, and indeed to others. That, because oh. that bypasses... I wouldn't call it a threat because as an as a, as a investor in producers, you know, we, we wouldn't rule out our own production businesses doing a deal with Netflix. We, we'd work on a mixed ecology of work for hire and re retained IP. Retained IP has to be at the core of everything we do, but I'm, the, the, the business is moving. And so a, you know, if, if uh, Netflix can retain its mo funding model of 130% of production budget, sometimes that's a good thing because not every show will sell internationally. And we look at a show and we think, well, actually, that's the right, that's the right deal on this occasion. Uh, whether that, whether that, that business model sustains as, right. as, as Netflix Do you think matures, it will sustain? I, 
I think once they plateau on their subscriptions, I think it's going to be difficult to, but for the moment it's fine and we're all making hay. So um, um, as, a, as a producer, it can be a good model as long as it's not the only model. You but one of the things they're able to do, Michael, is they're able to say, we don't really, we're not really interested in this sort of multi-territory sort of approach, territory by territory approach. We're interested in a global it, it deal, depends. right? And so that's, that's an issue for you? I think it's an issue. Um, it depends on the content. So right. for, you know, we have some shows that they are partners with. We're producing original content for them. We're also, um, they're acquiring some of our finished content. So uh, there's not a, a single strategy when it goes to how are we in business with Netflix. They, they've been very, very good partners to us in terms of our division for um, in the last few years. I think what we're concerned about in general is making the best shows, finding people who are deeply engaged in the content process. There are more choices than ever, and I think what's been touched on a little bit before us is the audience fragmentation, I think, is really dangerous for the PSBs here. And I think yeah. what we should be watching out for is making sure there are good shows for the PSBs so that that ecosystem continues to thrive. I agree. I think, the, I mean, just to echo a little bit, I mean, Netflix and Amazon, we've got huge businesses with. I mean, our sales number this year will go, we set a target, you know, three years ago for a long-term target of 400 million in sales. 400 million in sales from worldwide. We'll go, I'm hoping we'll go through that this year. Um, I, 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 and you know the SVOD market is fantastic, but healthy paranoia is the right thing. You've got you've got to you've got to worry about prominence. That but that is we're not victims in this conversation. We're mm. creative partners. They need our content. I, we've got a great Excellent. relationship with these Thank guys. You. Thank you, Tim. Let's make hey. We end on a celebration of creative paranoia. Is that what you said? <laughs> um, and on reflect and and on re, uh, healthy paranoia. And on reflecting that. All these models that we, guys who have been brilliant on this panel are trying any number of different approaches to do one thing, which is to, to own uh, the IP and ideally to create that IP and fight in that global marketplace. And it's a dynamic place to be. Um, but thank you guys very much. Thank, thank you. you, Michael, Jane, Tim, Stephen, for being on the panel. So a round of applause. Thank you. Um, um, thank you to the audience for your questions. Um, I, thought you, I, thought, I thought you were on fire. Um, and I now, it gives me pleasure to introduce the next session, which um, is going to finally answer the question you've all been asking, which is, what is Brexit? We're actually going to get that message um, coming up next. So um, a discussion about the impact of Brexit on, on, our, on our market and, um, and, and on companies within it. So thank you very much for listening to this one.